Hey everyone, a really important topic uh, to discuss when it comes to fertility care and particularly pregnancy care is progesterone. And progesterone is something that I think patients hear a lot about um, with regards to supplementing or having low progesterone um, or early signs of miscarriage and how that may relate to progesterone as well. And we're seeing over the last four to five years more and more um, valuable research on how progesterone can A, help uh, patients potentially conceive and which uh, patient subgroup, subgroups would benefit the most from utilizing something like progesterone and also seeing what types of progesterone may actually be more beneficial compared to others specifically for supporting fertility uh, may potentially help to reduce miscarriage rates and which ones seem to have safer uh, profiles for both the mother and for the baby, of course. So when we're looking at this research, um, number one, the question I think uh, healthcare providers and patients usually have is, what should my progesterone look like on the blood work? And the levels of progesterone we see on a blood test are not necessarily um, 100% accurate. And the reason for that is because serum progesterone, so the progesterone test we get from a blood test or a blood draw, can vary quite a bit. And within a period of two to three hours, it's estimated that that progesterone level might double or may go down to half or less. So it's not a hormone that's consistent in the blood level. So it can go up, it can go down. And so when we do a blood test, we're really just getting like a little snapshot in time and we don't know whether that progesterone was at the peak, at the valley, or somewhere in between. So we don't know what the average or what the progesterone levels are looking like. But still, a group of researchers recently set out and they wanted to examine what would an optimal progesterone level look like for patients that are going for fertility treatments uh, in the first trimester. And so they looked at a group of patients that were going for a frozen embryo transfer and were specifically doing an embryo transfer. Um, of a blastocyst, sorry. And so they looked at multiple cohort studies and they had these two criteria. So it had to be patients that were only doing a frozen embryo transfer and were transferring a single blastocyst. And they looked at what level of progesterone was associated with much better outcomes. So in their research, they established a very specific threshold. And basically they found if patients were above this level, they tend to see a higher likelihood of positive outcomes. And if they were below that level, they would have a high likelihood of seeing negative outcomes, unfortunately. And so it's very important to mention, first of all, that this research paper that came out isn't a single research paper in itself. Like it's, it's what we call a systematic review or meta-analysis. So systematic review or meta-analysis is looking at data from a, a variety or a a large group of studies and it's compiling that data, taking it all together and give us, giving us a more in-depth, profound understanding of the results we're seeing and what that means to, on, on patient care and how we can help potentially support patients and also guide future studies. So looking at these results, they basically found a specific level of progesterone, um, which was 10 nanograms per milliliter, which in Canadian units, uh, we go by nanomoles per liter. And that is roughly equivalent to about 31.8 nanomoles per liter, or if we round it, about 32. So basically they found that if the progesterone levels on a blood test for patients after a frozen embryo transfer, and patients after a frozen embryo transfer are usually on progesterone, but their levels in the blood can still vary quite a bit. So they're trying to help determine what levels of progesterone might be optimal or more beneficial for patients if they're going through that treatment process. So if patients had a progesterone level above 31.8 nanomoles per liter or 10 nanograms per milliliter, their chance of having a positive clinical pregnancy went up by approximately 31% compared to patients that didn't have a progesterone level above that threshold. So number one, this is a correlation. It is not causation, but it is still a very important trend. So we're seeing patients who have this high level of progesterone might have a better chance of getting pregnant or staying pregnant. And the next parameter they checked was what's called live birth rate. So this is different from clinical pregnancy. 
So clinical pregnancy is basically you have a positive blood test that confirms pregnancy and then you have a first ultrasound to confirm that everything is there, everything is looking healthy, there's a, a gestational sac, we're seeing um, everything looking as it should be. And that once we have that positive ultrasound blood test, that's what we call a clinical pregnancy. And then a live birth is when that patient goes on to give birth to a, a live healthy baby that didn't end in stillbirth or miscarriage. So same threshold in this, in this research paper that looked at multiple research papers. And basically what they found was that if the progesterone level for patients was again above 10 nanograms per milliliter or 31.8 nanomoles per liter, their chances of carrying to term and having a live birth was about 47% higher compared to patients that had a progesterone level lower than that. Okay, so now we're looking at patients, not only do we have a confirmed clinical pregnancy, but actually carrying to term with a live birth, and we're actually seeing a differentiation or a difference in the likelihood of that happening for patients based on their progesterone level. The third parameter they checked for was the miscarriage risk. So how many patients um, went on to have a miscarriage and what was a progesterone level, level like for them? And this is very important, and, and this is something we'll talk about in a future podcast to come, is the value that progesterone may have in reducing the risk of miscarriage. And what we've seen, just as a little preview for that, is not all progesterone forms are equal. We're seeing a very clear differentiation on one particular type of progesterone that seems to be more efficacious compared to other forms of progesterone and potentially reducing the risk of miscarriage, particularly for patients that have a history of miscarriages in the past. And even patients who don't have a miscarriage uh, history, they may notice some modest, mild potential decreases in the risk of a miscarriage with their first pregnancy. So just as a little preview to that, and we'll go into much more detail at a future date about this, so stay tuned for that. But in this study, basically what they found was that patients, if they used, um, if they had a progesterone level above 31.8 nanomoles per liter, their risk of miscarriage was about 38% lower compared to patients that had a progesterone level below that threshold. And so progesterone can have a really important um, impact in reducing spotting and may potentially help to reduce the risk of miscarriage as well. And the only type of progesterone that they looked at in this particular review was vaginal suppositories. So micronized progesterone used in the form of a vaginal suppository. So we're not looking at intramusc intramuscular injections here. They're not looking at oral progesterone pills. We're specifically looking at a vaginal suppository. And so those were the requirements for this study. Now, it's really important to mention, like when we look at these numbers, they look really promising and really encouraging, but it doesn't directly establish that just because we're seeing this differentiation between patients that have higher levels of progesterone and lower levels of progesterone and their potential outcome, that the progesterone is a reason why we're seeing these changes. So it's a, like we said, like I said earlier, it's a correlation, not a causation. So, you know, is that progesterone level simply higher because patients have a positive clinical pregnancy versus patients that didn't? Um, so is that progesterone level perhaps declining earlier for patients? Um, same thing for, for um, reduced miscarriage risk. Um, you know, is a healthier pregnancy more likely to produce more progesterone or not? So these are questions that we need more future studies to answer. But when we combine this study in combination with other research papers that are specifically looking at the benefit that progesterone may have in supporting pregnancy may potentially help to reduce the risk of miscarriage, we're starting to see a very clear image. And compared to back in like 2015, 2016, there were a lot more questions. And today we have a lot more answers compared to five, six years ago. And we have a good safety profile for some of these progesterone forms that we can actually speak um, comfortably with patients about what the potential risks or safety profile is like and objectively what is the potential re reduction in miscarriage risk we might see. And so this helps us to understand, you know, when, when once a patient comes in and they're pregnant, just to have an eye on what might, may potentially be a good threshold for progesterone levels. And if patients are on progesterone and it's still below that threshold, to potentially consider speaking with a healthcare provider or your fertility doctor about whether bringing that progesterone level up higher would be of increased uh, or provide increased benefit um, or be more efficacious for positive outcomes or not. So this is something we'll see with more future studies, hopefully, 
but it is still very important to mention this and it's still very important to be aware of this and for you to be aware of this because if you're going through a fertility treatment and you're seeing that you know if you're having spotting if you're still having low progesterone in blood tests then we really have to start asking questions on you know is it more valuable to increase that progesterone level further or not and this is going to be something that in my opinion is going to be determined on a case-by-case -case basis so it's something that has to be personalized and addressed individually with each patient there isn't there probably isn't going to be a wide recommendation for all patients and it's going to take into account previous health history uh, miscarriage history conditions and whether they predispose patients to lower progesterone or not and other factors so i will provide a, a video or a podcast at a later date talking about other forms of progesterone and how they may potentially have to reduce the risk of miscarriage and to what degree and um, for now that's all i have to share for you for today and as always if you guys ever have any questions you're always welcome to send us a message or a direct message or an email and we'll be happy to respond have a wonderful rest of your day, everyone. Bye-bye.